In the exposition, we are introduced to the setting and main characters. This story is set in the US in the far future, and it was written a long time ago, so it's likely set around 2030. It is very impressive how accurately he portrayed the future. We may not be as advanced as the technology in the story, but a lot of things in the story, like the motion detecting lights and the voice that is always listening in the house, are things that we have now. There was probably a lot of thought that went into predicting how the future would be and how they should set it up. Anyway, we are first introduced to the parents named George and Lydia Hadley and their $30,000 home, which is equipped with all the fancy gadgets. In their home, they have motion sensing lights, voice activating everything, and machines that cook them dinner, wash their clothes, and do the dishes. But the fanciest thing in their home is the nursery, which was half the cost of the whole house. The nursery was a giant white room, but once it was turned on, it became anything you could imagine. It was an area for the children to run free, and whatever they thought of would become a reality. This room reminds me of the holodeck from Star Trek, which had the same concept and I find it very fascinating. I wonder when this type of room will become a reality. After we learned about the house and all its features, the psychologist is mentioned, who only enters the story later down the line. We are also introduced to the two children named Wendy and Peter. Wendy and Peter live for the nursery, as George says. They have grown up in the nursery, and it is where they spend all their spare time. The nursery is where they go to find comfort, or to just have some fun. It does all the jobs that parents usually do. One day, Lydia tells George they need to go and check out the nursery, and that they may need to get the psychologist involved again. They go and check it out, and it's incredibly immersive, as always. Almost too immersive. It is set in Africa, which it has been for the past few weeks now, as per the children's decision. They see something being eaten by a lion, but it's too far gone to tell what it is. The mother's very concerned, and they set it up to make it seem like the children could have been eaten. This is likely foreshadowing, since at the end of the story, they are also eaten by lions. Next, the lions suddenly noticed them, and started moving toward them. George was amazed at how real they looked, and he was filled with respect for the inventor of the room. Then the lions charged. Lydia was terrified and turned and ran. Without thinking, George ran after her. The conflict is man versus man, because it is the parents against the kids. The children want to keep the nursery, and they will do anything for it, while the parents want to turn off the nursery, because they see what it is doing to their children. Rising Action Event Number 1 Lydia thinks the nursery is too real, and wants to shut the whole house off for a few days and take a vacation. They talk about this, and George is concerned because the kids live for the nursery, and even when they lock it for just a few hours, the children are furious. But seeing how distraught his wife Lydia is, George reluctantly agrees that it wouldn't hurt for them to be locked out of the nursery for just a few days. George decides to go back into the nursery, and he is troubled about how much death has been going on and how the children always seem to have it set to Africa instead of the endless other possibilities, like Alice in Wonderland or Aladdin and his magical lamp. George starts to agree with Lydia after seeing all the lions and vultures killing and eating. He tries to change the room to Aladdin, but the room won't listen. He leaves in a huff and complains to Lydia that the room is busted, but she is more concerned. She thinks that the room is stuck in Africa, since this is all the children have imagined for so long. At this point in the story, I was very nervous, and I would have been a lot more worried than George and Lydia were. The children seem a little too mysterious, and maybe even evil. Lydia thinks Peter could have even gotten into the machinery and set it to stay on Africa. They start to worry, but before they can do anything more, the children come in the door. Rising action number two. George asks about the nursery and Africa, but Peter and Wendy just act confused. They say there is no Africa, but George knows better. He had just seen it with his own eyes, after all. Wendy goes to check it out and reports there is no Africa. They all go to see if she is telling the truth, and surprisingly, the nursery has changed, and it is now a peaceful forest with a lovely river running through it. This was not a good sign to me. Also, them going through all the trouble to hide Africa makes it seem like they were trying to hide something bad. Next. The children go off to bed, and before George and Lydia could leave the nursery, George sees something where the lions had been, and he picks it up. He shows Lydia, and it is an old wallet of his, 
It was ravaged by tooth marks and the smell of hot grass was on it. It was also covered in saliva, so it must have been in a lion's mouth, and there was dried blood on both sides. They left right after that and locked the door tight, terrified of what this bad omen could mean. This was more foreshadowing, showing that the lions can, in fact, interact with things in the real world, which is terrifying. Rising action number three. They go to bed and talk about what had just happened in the nursery. They both agree that Wendy had changed it from Africa just before they walked in. They start talking and they both notice that the kids have been much colder and more hostile ever since George refused to let them go to New York alone a few months ago. The mother decides to call the psychologist early the next morning for him to come over and check out the nursery. As they were falling asleep, they heard another scream and then a lion roar, which they have been hearing all throughout the story. The screams and lion roars are even more foreshadowing for what will happen later in the story with them getting eaten and they serve as somewhat of a warning. The next morning, they talk to the kids about locking the nursery and even possibly shutting down the house for a month. George says it could be fun, but Peter disagrees passionately. He says that George had better not shut off the nursery anytime soon and George says he won't take any threats. Peter agreed and went off to play in Africa. Climax. Then the psychologist David McLean showed up. They went to check out the nursery, and they walked in on the kids without knocking. There was a lion eating something as usual, and George told the kids to wait outside, which they did. The psychologist David asks how long this has been going on, and George says just over a month now. David says he had a nose for something bad, and that the veldt is very, very bad, which does not bode well. He says the children have a real problem and they should tear down the room and that the children should be brought to him every day for the next year for treatment. He says that George has let this room and this house replace him and his wife in the children's hearts. David says it makes sense how they're acting because it is like George is trying to take their parents away from them. His advice is for them to shut down the whole house and that is the only way to help Peter and Wendy. George asks if the shock would be too great for the children to handle. But David said, they will get over it, and it would be bad if they got any deeper into this. Then the lions finished their meal and started eyeing George and David. David suggested that they get out of there because he was starting to feel uneasy. It's a good thing that they got out of there when they did because it is likely that they would have gotten eaten if they hadn't. And George is wondering if the lions could somehow become real, but David says not that he knows of. They are both very uneasy and scared of the nursery at this point, so they decide to go turn it off right away. They also talk about how the room probably hates George for wanting to turn it off, and they give the room feelings, which I find very interesting. It makes it that much scarier, since it's almost like it's coming alive. Then George turns it off without hesitating. The children were furious. They jumped on furniture, yelled rude names, and threw things. The children were yelling about how he can't be so cruel to the room, which is again giving it feelings and almost making it seem alive according to the children. Lydia also protests, saying how he can't be so cruel and that it's too sudden, but George doesn't listen and he goes around the whole house turning everything off. This is the turning point where there is no going back and where the children become his full-fledged enemies, at least in their eyes. Then Peter started yelling at his father saying how much he hates him and how he wishes he was dead before going back to crying and begging for just one more minute in the nursery. Lydia also says why not give them just one more minute so George agrees and turns it back on while he goes upstairs to get dressed. Falling action. The parents go and pack their bags for moving out while the kids take their final minute in the nursery. As they were on their way back down to turn off the nursery, they hear their children calling, saying to come quickly. They couldn't see them, so without thinking, they ran into the nursery, since that's where they had been last. It was empty, aside from the lions waiting there, for them. They kept calling for their kids, and as they walked deeper into the veldt, the door slammed and locked behind them. They ran back to the door and started screaming. The kids had locked it from outside. They heard Peter at the other side of the door, saying not to let them shut off the nursery or any part of the house. They kept banging on the door, begging for Peter to let them out. That's when they heard the lions. They were surrounded with lions snarling and growling. They both screamed suddenly, and they realized why those screams had sounded familiar. They were eaten.
The author left it up to speculation for what this could mean, but I think the reason the screams sounded familiar was because the children had been fantasizing over killing their parents, and that the screams they had been hearing throughout the story were really their screams the whole time. Resolution Then David McLean showed up again and asked where Wendy and Peter's parents had gone. They said they would be down in a minute. While David waited, he watched the lions fight over some scrap of food, but thought nothing of it. Then Wendy asked if he would like a cup of tea, and that is where the story ends. The children seem very calm at the end, which is completely different from how they acted throughout the rest of the story. This makes it seem even creepier, since the children seem happier after they killed their parents. The children really are evil in this story. Overall, this story was very enjoyable to read, and I could not stop turning the pages. It had me yelling at it, telling them not to turn the nursery back on, which is always a sign of a great story. For example, Star Wars has the scene where Anakin turns to the dark side after chopping Master Windu's arm off. It was that one decision which rippled into his whole life being ruined, just like the parents turning the nursery back on again. This story was amazing overall, and I look forward to reading more stories written by Ray Bradbury.